Well, welcome everyone to this overview of the multiple mini interview style commonly used by medical schools both in Australia and overseas. Um, just before we get started, if, uh, if you have any questions about medicine, UMAT or interviews, or if you'd like some free resources or not so free but still very affordable private tutoring or mock interviews as you can see there, then please get in touch via the email address at the top of the page. And I think there's more information on all that in the description box under the video. So I thought I'd begin just by giving you a bit of background into the nature of this sort of interviewing. Um, so I'll tell you about how the day normally runs, uh, which universities use this sort of uh, interviewing method, and then uh, tell you about my experiences and give some general uh, tips for the, for, for the day in general. And after that we'll go into the different types of stations they can use, uh, and we'll do a few example questions from each um, around here with the questions about you and your relation to medicine we'll do a pretty comprehensive look at all the questions that I feel they could ask you. And then for the ones such as moral dilemmas and uh, simplification, we'll just do one or two examples, uh, which should be enough for you to get an idea for it. Um, yeah, and then we'll, we'll finish up after that. So if you want to go ahead and, and skip to different parts of the video, then check out the description box. Um, but otherwise, we'll just go through one by one. So I thought I'd just begin by showing you all the different medical schools in Australia. Uh, and I, I've sort of broken them into different categories based on the style of their interview in the admissions process. So you may know that, that broadly speaking there are two different types of interview styles. One is the MMI, which is the topic of this video, uh, and all of these universities in Australia use that style of interview in their admissions process. Um, but many still use the traditional panel style interview, which are all these ones on the right. So I just thought I'd, I'd put that in for reference in case you were wondering whether the medical school or schools you're interviewing at uh, use this style or that one there. Um, so yeah, if, if, if you have an interview at one of these universities, then hopefully this video will be particularly useful for you. Uh, if you don't, if you're at one of these ones, then um, it still may be of some use given that there's a lot of overlap between the two different styles. So uh, either way, I just thought I'd put that in for reference for you. Uh, if you're watching this from overseas, if your interviews are in another country, um, then hopefully you'll know whether it's whether your interview is in this style or that style, um, because the MMI is now becoming quite extensive overseas too. So this is just a depiction of the way the day normally runs. So what we've got here is uh, eight to ten different rooms, which are called stations, which are sort of in a row, often just along a corridor. And within each room or station, we've got a single interviewer, normally, behind a desk, and then obviously the, the candidates or interviewees, which is you guys outside. So what tends to happen is um, you begin by reading a bit of paper, which is either on the door or on a chair next to the door, which sort of gives you a bit of an outline as to what the station will be. So I won't give you the specifics of the question, but it will give you an idea of what sort of task will be behind the door, which just gives you a chance to sort of get in the zone. So you have one or two minutes to do that, and then the bell will ring, and that means go inside. So you knock on the door usually, and then shake the hand, uh, sit down with them, and then answer a few questions. And this is the basis of this video, is the different questions I can ask you. Usually each station lasts only about six to ten minutes, and the interview is pretty, pretty friendly normally. They're only just a faculty member or a doctor, so that they're pretty friendly. They don't they're not there to trip you up. Um, and in fact, if you're if you're waffling on a bit too much, they'll cut you off in a friendly way, so that you can get all your answers in. Uh, likewise, if you're if you're not saying much, then they'll encourage you and and ask you additional questions. So they're pretty kind. Um, but after your six to ten minutes is up, another bell will ring. You'll say thank you, leave the room and then everyone shuffles across one room. You read the card on the door next to you, uh, well, you know, in front of you at this point, uh, and then the process repeats itself again. And of course the other nice thing about this system is that because you move rooms every few minutes, you end up being seen by you know, nine or ten different interviewers, which means you get nine or ten different opinions of yourself. So if you say something particularly stupid in one of the rooms, or if you don't like one of the interviewers, or if they don't like you, it doesn't really matter because there are you know eight or nine different rooms 
and therefore eight or nine different chances to impress. And each time it's a clean slate. There's no, you know, you don't come with any baggage. It's a, it's a fresh start every room. Um, and the other nice thing is that some universities also will kind of eliminate your two low scoring rooms and just take the top six or seven, which means that even if you sort of break down and start crying uh, in one of the rooms or just get nothing right, then that's okay uh, because they'll just be cut out of your score. So in that sense, this, this style does give you a lot of room to move and sort of takes the pressure off quite a bit. So I, I went through this style of interview two years in a row. The first year was when I just finished up school um, and I had a good ATAR, a really good UMAT. And I kind of felt like if I, if I knew why I wanted to be a doctor, if I knew what it took, if I had a few life stories behind me, and if I knew about the uni and the course, um, but that would sort of be enough to get me through the interviews. And as it turned out, I was dead wrong, and I sort of came up short, and I sort of knew it at the time too, the interviews didn't go great. Um, I did say some pretty stupid things, and a lot of the time I had no idea what to say. So in the end, even though I had a few different unis, I had interviews that I didn't get any offers at all. So the following year, I sort of looked back and looked at all the different stations they'd been and the different questions that asked me from across all the universities. And I sort of tried to piece them together and work out all the different sort of questions they could ask and the different angles they could come at uh, in asking them. And I sort of wrote this down and, and compiled this uh, and then jotted down a few notes for each question. So I didn't have a word for word answer because then you begin to sound like a robot. But I just thought if I could have something to say for each different question, something quite intelligent, that would be a much better approach. Uh, and so I sort of treated it like an exam and then went into it. I only had one interview the second year, um, but it went really well. And in the end, I ended up getting a place with a scholarship for having the highest entrance score. So I found that quite amazing. The difference between not getting in, you know, i.e. being ranked below 200 and being ranked number one, the difference between that is sort of a bit more preparation. So just finally, before we get into the specific stations, just a few tips about the day in general. So the top one, the top point there is dress. Uh, I really don't think it matters what you wear, to be honest. Um, certainly the instructions the university will give you will probably say, uh, dress whatever you feel most comfortable in. We won't judge you on your appearance. And for the most part, I, I think that's true. Um, certainly in the first year I went to do my interviews when it went pretty badly, I was wearing a suit. Uh, and in, in the second year, when it went really well, I was wearing something much less formal. It was like jeans and my vans and the sort of bogan patterns, short sleeve top. So I, I don't think it matters at all, to be honest. Um, whatever you feel most comfortable in. I think if you dress down, then it, it shows that, for one thing, you can follow the instructions. You know, the instructions the uni give you about wearing something comfortable. For the, second, uh, the second thing is that it, it means that you will be comfortable. And also it sort of lends itself quite nicely to the, you know, the picture of the modern doctor being at the same level as the patient and, you know, treating them as a, as a human being rather than just a patient and sort of having all that patient-centered care. It sort of, it, it makes you sort of appear more human, I think, um, but it shouldn't really matter either way. The second dot point there is about timing. So, like I mentioned before, the interviewers will sort of guide you in the sense that if you're rambling on they'll cut you off and if you're not saying much they'll encourage you to say more but there's still the possibility that you might uh, run out of time so again just keep in mind and maybe even practice the art of sort of giving nice detailed answers but still being concise and not rambling on giving superfluous answers and, and statements uh, the third dot point don't think, uh, sorry, don't feel obliged to answer straight away. Often when you do, if you don't really think about it, you'll say something which is a bit stupid or just very poorly phrased. So just take a deep breath. Um, you can say sentences like, well, that depends, or hmm, that's a good one. Something just to fill in a bit of time and give you a bit of time to think. Uh, fourth point, it's about, not only about what you say, but how you say it. So really you're being judged mostly on what you say but the interviewers are only human and if you come across as a really nice warm person then that can only help your cause uh, 
Yeah, and the, the final point is just that again, showing that these attributes, uh, maturity, empathy, they're always a good thing to have. So now onto the different types of questions you can be given. And I'm going to begin with moral or ethical dilemmas. So the idea with these questions is that you'll be given a scenario which is quite ethically difficult. Um, and this may be in the medical context. So you might be a doctor or a medical student, or they could be just general. So you could just be a, a member of society. Um, and so you, you read the situation and then we'll be asked a series of questions about how you deal with it. So um, in a minute I'll show you an example of this. So uh, for now, just try and understand these tips, but they'll become clearer in a minute when you see an example. So first point is, uh, broadly speaking, when you're given a scenario like this, there's usually only two options you can take, broadly speaking. So um, it doesn't matter usually which one you take, but the important thing is that you do take one over the other and that you make that pretty clear. So the only way you can really, really mess this up is if you sit on the fence. So uh, it usually doesn't matter which side you take as long as you can justify it. There's one exception to that, which is when the, uh, the dilemma is between uh, independence and authority. So what I mean by that is, uh, for example, if there's a, a dilemma where uh, you're not sure whether to turn someone into the police or not after they've committed a crime, um, you would you should do so because you want to side with the police rather than the individual, even if they're your friend or they've done good, because um, you don't want to be seen as someone who evades the law. Um, so that's sort of an overview of it. Um, while you're meant to pick a side, your approach in general should be that you should sort of make the case for both sides and then eventually pick one. So you want to sort of, in your response, you want to begin by saying, well, on the one hand, uh, I can see why um, option one is valid because of these points, and I can see why option two is valid because of these points, um, but at the end I'll, I'll side with option one or option two because of this reason. So give both, give both arguments and then just pick one at the end. Uh, and in doing so, try not to let your personal or political or religious views influence your answer. So you want to be seen as quite impartial. Um, and the last three points are just about the specifics of how you can deal with these sort of questions. So the third last point here, um, all that's saying is that if you're stuck for good points, if you, if you can't think of uh, very many points to support your argument, uh, a great point to make is that you would need to look into all the details of the problem they've given to you in more detail. Um, and furthermore, you probably want to make sure that all the details they've given to you are accurate. So when they ask you, what would you do in this situation? A great thing to say first up is, well, I need to make sure that all the facts are correct. Um, that's a good one to buy some time. Um, the penultimate point, um, Emphasize your empathy towards all involved. So in this brief example here about whether or not to turn someone into the police, um, so you would you would side with authority, as I mentioned before, but you would still emphasize how you would deal with the person who you were turning into the police in a very kind uh, and sensitive manner. So instead of just saying, "Oh, I, I turned them in," you would say, "Well, you know, I take them to, I take them away from." a crowd if there were people there, I'd sort of explain to them why I was doing what I was doing. Um, I would suggest that if uh, that the, the police would take the right course of action, so on and so on. You would go into detail about how you would uh, deal with individuals. Uh, and the final point is just that if, well occasionally the interviewer will try and sort of play devil's advocate and say, well what about the other case, what about the other option, isn't that better because of these reasons? And the important thing is that you just keep your cool and stick to the side you've taken. So don't be seen to be kind of someone who can be influenced easily. Just hold your point, hold your case, um, and then reiterate your points and just hold your ground. So here's a typical moral dilemma question. On the day of the interview, if you walked into a room where this is the station, the interviewer would give you a bit of paper which would give you sort of something like these top five lines here, which would give you the scenario. And you'd be given as much time as you needed to read that, after which they'd ask you a few questions, such as these ones here. So if you want to have a go at that question and 
I think about your response in terms of the advice I gave on the slide before. Um, then I'll give you a few seconds now just to, to pause the video. Okay, so these are the points I'd have for this question. So the, dot, the top dot point there is that you should mention the bits of the question that ideally you'd like clarification on. So what this dot point is saying is that usually the question or the scenario that they give you will be very general. There won't be much in the way of detail. So um, in this question you can see there's lots of very general statements here. It's a friend, but you don't know if it's a, a long-term friend or, or a sort of a, a friend you don't know too well. Um, it says they're anxious, but it doesn't say why, if it's just their general personality or if it's because they know how important it is not to miss lectures or if it's because of financial problems or other problems. Um, it says, just mentions part-time work, it doesn't say what it is, if it's important they do have to go, if they have any people who can fill in for them, that sort of thing. Um, and then the final sentence there, um, told that missing compulsory lectures would result in a fail. So again, it doesn't say if it's just one lecture, if they miss one lecture, if that's a fail, or if it's three or four or all of them. So these are all the bits of the question which ideally you'd want to have clarification on. You'd want to know the details. So the interviewer won't give them to you um, because they haven't written the question that way. This is all there is. But you're just saying that if you had to respond to this, that's what your first um, action would be, would be to find out the details of this, get more information, so the second point there is that you should discuss the pros and cons of either option. So this is what we mentioned on the page before about making the argument for both possible options. So uh, in answering this question, you would you would make the argument for signing off your friend, and then you make it up make the argument for not signing them off. Um, just to show that you understand why this is a dilemma in the first place, so you can see where the conflict is. Um, but ultimately, when you pick a side, I think in this particular example, um, you should side with authority. Again, like I mentioned on the, on the slide before. So in this case, the authority is the university, and the independent figure is your friend. And the reason why you want to side with authority is because, keep in mind, this is, I mean, this, this interview is at a university. You don't want to be seen as someone who's trying to, you know, in this scenario, someone who is trying to, you know, um, sneak past the university and their, um, you know, lectures. You're going to be seen as someone who does right by the university, in other words. So the correct side to take in this particular question, and there isn't always a side to take, sometimes it doesn't matter, but in this question you should probably sign off, oh, sorry, don't sign off your friend. So don't sign off. Um, so even though you wouldn't sign them off, you would mention how you would use empathy when dealing with them. So instead of just saying, I wouldn't sign them off, Full stop. So I would find them, make sure they were alone, find them at a good time, and then instead of just saying, I'm not signing you off, give them other options. So maybe you could go to the faculty with them to discuss other options, uh, or uh, help them explore different options financially, if that's the reason why they need to work. Just, you know, show, show that you can go into detail and think of different options as a solution to the, to the problem. Uh, and the last up point is just saying that if you're asked a, a follow-up question like number two here, then again you should hold your ground and say it doesn't matter whether it's one lecture or all of them that she's missing, uh, even though the implications for all of them would be worse. Um, it doesn't matter which way or which one it is, if it's just one or all of them, either way that would be my response to, to not sign them off. So leading on from the moral dilemma questions, are those questions which ask you to prioritise um, a series of patients based on their information about them? So typically you'll be asked to imagine you're the doctor and then the interviewer will present you with a few profiles of patients. So just, you know, four, say, you know, usually four bits of paper um, with four different people on it with their pictures and then sort of a few dot points about you know, their age, occupation, um, you know, smoking status, so on, underneath. Um, and usually you either prioritise them in terms of um, like the same treatment, so often it's a transplant, for example. Um, and if that's the case, then you can't distinguish between them based on the nature of the treatment, because the treatment is the same for all. So then you have to differentiate between them based on their sort of 
demographic information or their personal information. So if you just look down here, this is sort of what you should look at for questions where um, you're asked to prioritise for a transplant. So factors to use in prioritising them include how severe their condition is, so obviously more severe you'd rank them higher, their age, lower age would rank them higher, smoking status, non-smokers rank higher, um, comorbidities, which is sort of conditions which they have in addition to the main condition, which might be the, the failing organ in this case. So, you know, uh, better overall health and less uh, comorbidities would rank them higher. A strong mental status would rank them higher and then uh, a lot of responsibilities in terms of their family role would rank them higher. So those are the ones you should draw on in making your decision. The ones that you should stick away or stay away from are these ones here. So don't let their social status influence you if you have a politician or a doctor or a lawyer or someone. That doesn't make them any better than anyone else. In, so don't preference them high because of that. Um, if their family, if in the scenario their family is sort of, um, you know, haranguing you about um, the importance of their family member and that, you know, this has happened before and this happened and, you know, they give you an anecdote, that doesn't matter. It shouldn't affect your decision. Um, and you shouldn't obviously bring in any personal favouritism. So don't use these ones, just draw on, you know, the basic uh, profile information that they, they give you. It's, you know, pretty basic. Um, ethical stuff. If the question gives you sort of four different profiles, so in other words four different patients who are waiting for four different treatment options, then mostly it's the nature of the treatment option which determines their rank. So if someone has a, a cut finger, they rank lower than someone who needs oxygen urgently. You know, it's, it's fairly basic stuff. You won't need to draw on any medical knowledge in determining this. It's pretty pretty much common sense. Um, yep, so these are sort of the points for those those questions. But really it's basically it's basic ethics and common knowledge about medicine. Um, and you know just justify your decisions. Okay, so now I move on to questions about you. Uh, and for the next three sections of this video, so which I think which are questions about you, questions about you in relation to medicine and a discussion on qualities, um, I've tried to list all the possible questions I think they could throw at you, uh, realistically. So, um, in preparing for your own interview, I would recommend sort of jotting down a few notes for each of these. That would set you up pretty well. Um, let's begin with the first one, which is tell us about yourself. Um, it sounds pretty easy, but it can be difficult because it's so broad that you sort of think, well, you know, what do I, what do I draw on in answering this? Um, I think the important thing to remember is that because you're at the interview stage at that point they know you're pretty bright, so you don't need to keep, you know, bang on about, oh, I was ducks and I was in this Olympiad and, you know, so on. It's more about you as a person and you, you know, other sports and hobbies and interests. So I would sort of mention maybe any interesting background to you. So if you weren't born in the country um, or if you moved here, that's a good story to pull up. Any sort of um, big life moments, um, any hobbies, any sports, any languages, just, you know, a bit of a, a brief overview. Um, and if you can make them laugh at this point, um, that'd be a good, a good move because that kind of really gets them on side. So that's sort of all you can do with that question. Give a few hobbies, sports, languages, activities, um, try to make them laugh and you should be, you should be right for that one. So the next two points sort of work off that. Um, they, so what are your hobbies? and do you play any sports or any other um, extracurricular activities. So obviously ideally you'll have a few um, and it's, it's fairly straightforward, just explain um, what hobbies or sports they are, um, sort of how often you partake in those and then often a follow-up question will be what have you learned from these, which is a good thing to incorporate into the answer even if they don't mention that. So even if you just get posed that question you can sort of begin to mention what you've learned from it and what it shows about you. Um, and if they if they cut you off, then obviously they won't need that. But if they if they're after that they'll keep you keep you going for a while. So just mention what you do. Have a think about before the interview, have a think about what your hobbies and sports say about you. So things like whether you're a team player or not, 
um, whether you support others, um, what's your what's your particular role in the team? Are you like a captain, or um, you know, in terms of your playing style, what does that show about you? All those sort of things. Um, just have something ready. Just think about what you do and what that shows about you in relation to medicine. Um, the third dot point, or fourth actually, is what achievement are you most proud of? Or it might be uh, a slight variation on that. Just, you know, what are some of your proudest achievements? So I'll give a few. Again, like I mentioned before, I think they know that you're pretty bright. So you don't want to say, you know, oh, I topped this subject and that subject and so on. They want you to kind of, um, you know, have a few other areas which you're quite good at. So proudest achievement could be, again, a hobby or a sport, something related to that particular moment. Or it could be sort of a charity thing. That'd be a very good option if you sort of, you know, did a, a charity run for something where you fundraise. That would be a very good option for this question. So then we get to this one here about a key event in your life. So this one can be a bit tricky if you're a school leaver and you haven't had much in the way of life experiences. Um, but the interviewers sort of know that. They're not expecting a massive um, key event in your life. Um, so long as you can kind of explain, or as long as you can sort of justify it and then explain what effect it had on you, um, and hopefully what effect it had on you in a positive way, that should be fine. So key events could include um, moving countries, moving states, moving schools. If you have a, a hobby you're particularly passionate about, maybe it was the moment you were introduced to that. Just some sort of big formative event which changed the course of your life, hopefully for the better. That's, that's fine for that one. Then you get to these two about your influences in your family. So um, parents are probably the biggest influence, but also school teachers, coaches, family friends, just anyone, even I guess celebrities or sort of, you know, hopefully in a good way. Um, just anyone, again, as anyone really, as long as you can justify it. Um, and then hopefully for this one, you have a good relationship with both parents. This is another good um, opportunity to kind of crack a joke and make them smile and get them on side um, in you know, describing your grandparents or parents if they're quite a character. But just, you know, if it's, as long as it's true, make it seem as though um, you have a very good relationship with both of them. Um, and yeah, if you can sort of go into details about that, it shows that you're quite good with people and you understand different personalities. Um, then these two about your school years, hopefully you can give the impression that they were reasonably happy and that you were sort of, you had a group which you were, you know, quite happily belonging to and that that was a quite a sensible group and a good grounding for you. Um, you might need to lie about this bit if you discuss some things which you probably shouldn't discuss or that they don't want to hear about. Um, but again, just make this, try and, try and make this seem quite, you know, happy and positive and constructive these two. And then this one, um, well, I mean, that's that's just whatever it is for you. Um, hopefully it's quite, hopefully it's a proper book rather than, you know, um, a magazine or something. Um, and try to think what that taught you, or what you got from that. And maybe you can link it into medicine somehow, uh, even better, but you don't need to. So onto the second page of questions about you. Um, so the top two points there are just what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses, which is pretty self-explanatory. Um, but they may come at you from a few different angles with these questions. So they may simply ask you to respond normally, or they may ask you to respond in a few single words. So if they ask you, you know, in a few words, what are your strengths, you'd have to say, okay, um, you know, kindness, empathy, intelligence or something. Um, or they could ask you from the perspective of someone else, such as a friend or family member. So that requires you to sort of, well, in theory, it requires you to think outside the box and think from someone else's perspective. So there are different ways they can phrase it, and they sort of require slightly different responses each time. So just have a think about that. Um, and really, any strength will do, because to be a good doctor sort of requires quite a lot of different attributes. So most can link into to being a doctor in some way. Um, weaknesses are harder because, again, because so many attributes link into being or are important in being a good doctor. It's hard to find one which doesn't or isn't too incriminating. So, I mean, things like being shy or not being good at public speaking can be quite good um, because they're not 
you know, absolutely vital in being a doctor, but they, they are a genuine weakness, not trying to pass off a strength as a weakness, which is, you know, not a good thing to do. So again, um, there's different ways they can frame that question, and your response will be different, hopefully, based on that. So then often after that you've, um, you've answered the question about the weaknesses, they'll follow up with a few questions about um, your weaknesses in general, because they know it's quite difficult to answer and, and catches people out. So a typical one is, describe a time someone's been critical of your nature, and what did you do to improve on this? So again, I mean, particularly if you're young, this might be um, difficult to answer. And it's the sort of one where if you don't prepare and they ask you that, you'll just probably sit there a bit dumbfounded. So do try and think of a time when someone's been a bit critical of you. Um, and hopefully, I mean, the bigger the, the fault, the, the better in a way. Um, obviously, you don't want it to be too incriminating, um, but, you know, you don't want to... You don't want to mention, oh, this one time a teacher at school, you know, shouted at me because I was being naughty. You want it to be something which is quite integral to your character. So it's a fine line, but just try and think of something. Um, and more importantly is what you did to improve that. Uh, and then similar question below, what is an aspect of your own character which you've improved recently? So same question, but instead of someone else being critical, it's showing that you have the ability to pick up on your own weakness and improve upon it. So yeah, some similar similar advice for that one, um, but have a different one for both of these questions, just in case they pull out both. Um, and then sort of based on that again, what would you most like to improve in future? And that's sort of a bit easy to answer because, um, you know, it's not saying what are you bad at. It's saying you know you can take this question as being, you know, even if you're good at something, what would you still like to become better at? So you could say, well, I'm okay at this, but I would want to be better in the future. So you know, you're not you're not being forced to admit it's a weakness. So take that approach to that. So now we get on to questions about you in relation to your desire to study medicine. Um, and again, I'll, I'll try to give you all the different questions I feel they could realistically throw at you on the day. So we begin with the top one, which is the classic question of why do you want to study medicine? Um, and given it is such a common question, I would recommend having a few different reasons. Uh, in, in your response. So just work out what it is that is driving your desire to study medicine, um, whether it may be an interest in the sciences, the desire to help people, the desire to work in a team, um, the desire to be in, in a field which is uh, changing so rapidly, um, the ability to have a career where every day is different, those sort of things. Just work out which ones apply to you, which ones uh, are driving your desire to be a doctor and just uh, have those ready on the day. The second top one here is kind of following on from that, but it's sort of framed in a slightly loaded fashion in that it's asking you what you want to get out of medicine rather than what you want to give to the field of medicine. So just be careful with that. Um, I mean, you know, it's sort of, you, you should mention the same things, helping people, working in a team, being intellectually stimulated. Um, maybe also just mention that it's more about what you want to put back then what you want to take out of it. Now the third point there is just to make sure that you understand the length and the nature of medical training you'll undergo if you get into the course. So obviously the course itself will be uh, four to six years, which is the university course, uh, after which you'll do one year of internship, which is when you work at a hospital uh, as a doctor. You are a doctor and you do get paid, but you are right at the bottom of the pecking order of doctors. Uh, and you're not, you're not specialised, you just sort of go around the different uh, specialties in teams uh, working in a fairly low capacity. Uh, after that you become a resident, which lasts one to three years, the residency, and that's pretty similar to internship, but you're a bit more senior. Um, and after that you begin to specialise. So specialist training will be three to six years, um, even general practice is a specialty now, so that requires training. So regardless of what you go into, um, it'll be about 12 to 15 years of training until you're fully qualified, until you're a, a consultant, as they call. So this question is just making sure you understand that and you understand a bit about the structure of it. Um, and a good thing to mention too is that even once you're fully qualified, uh, you'll still obviously have to keep up to date with new developments, so it never really stops the learning. The fourth dot point about the worst things, um, again, this is just making sure you understand the nature and the reality of a medical career. So 
some of the worst things could be the long hours, the fact that it compromises the, the work-life balance, um, the stress, the fact that you'll be around uh, sort of suffering and death, uh, unpleasant circumstances, having to break bad news, that sort of thing. Just have a think about that. So this question here is just about why you choose or why you've chosen medicine over other similar careers. So the three I think they could throw at you are medical science, uh, physiotherapy and nursing. So just have a think about why you've gone for medicine over those three, what makes them different and what's what appeals to you about medicine in particular. So I think I said something about uh, medical science not offering the same level of uh, you know, direct exposure to patients and, and people in need, uh, all the same opportunities with you know teamwork. Um, and I think nursing didn't offer quite the same depth in, in uh, scientific background and, and coursework. That sort of thing. So just have a think about why medicine over those three. Um, for the second last one, um, even though you may not know what you want to specialise in, given that you know at this point you're not even in medical school, um, and even if you were, it would still be you know a decision which you'd have to make in ten years' time. So you may not know what you want to specialise in, but the interviewers want to hear something from you about that. They want to know something about um, you and which direction you think you might head in. So if you know what you're sort of interested in, um, even though it may change, just mention that, and give the reasons why, and that should be fine. If you don't, then um, general practice is not a bad one to, to use because it is realistic in that most people end up in general practice. And it's also sort of a bit of a worry about um, future shortages of GPs uh, and sort of, you know, the, the specialty being seen is not very prestigious. So it's not, not a bad option if you, can, if you can justify why that interests you. And the final question is just about, um, it's sort of a combination of the two above it. So you just have to sort of know roughly what point of the training will be in at different points in time, you know, five years, ten years, so on. Um, and sort of what specialty you might be at that point if you know what you want to go into. Um, so a few more questions now. The top two there are just about uh, the university trying to work out if you understand the nature of their course and if you've done your research into their course. So it's important just to have a look at the university guides and sort of their, you know, any information booklets they give you in relation to the medical course. Because all the courses around Australia are a bit different uh, in their length and their structure uh, and their focus too. Some might be sort of more research focused, um, others might be more focused on rural health or tropical health or, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So um, just have an understanding of what makes that university a bit different from the others and work out what about that particularly interests you and, and sort of just look into what, you know, a, a normal week might be in the early years and the later, more clinical years. Um, and if they ask what you've done to look into this, then, you know, again, just university guides, uh, maybe talking to current students is a great thing to say. Um, you know, information days, open days, just as many different sources of information as is, as is possible. So the question of what would you do if you didn't get into the medical course, or into any medical course? Uh, so with this one, be honest, but the best response probably would be that you would try again the following year, because that shows that you are serious about becoming a doctor, and that it's not just a, a fleeting thought. So um, yeah, that would be the best option probably, would be to say that you'll try again the following year. As for what you do in the meantime, in that intervening year, um, you know, again, that depends on what is true for you. So you may go and do a different course, science or nursing or physiotherapy. You might go on a gap year or, or spend a year working in a hospital or overseas. Just, you know, wh whatever it is. But the best option is to show that you are still very serious about it. Um, as for these, these three, they're fairly self-explanatory, so I won't go into too much detail, but I would say that, you know, for this one, for example, you'd want to have sort of seven or eight different uh, points for what makes up a good doctor, because it's the sort of question where it seems simple, but on the day when you're under pressure, you know, it's very easy to have a, a you know, a mind blank and just sort of uh, not be able to, to come up with that many. So write down seven or eight which you feel are, are particularly important for a doctor to have. And then again, think of, you know, two or three aspects of your own character, which would be well-suited and not so well-suited. So this kind of goes back to your, your strengths and weaknesses. 
And then the, then the last two, which are um, about what improvements you might have to make to become a doctor and what being a doctor might improve or change in you. Uh, so again, this sort of harks back to the weakness thing we talked about before, which is quite difficult. So try and find one which is not too incriminating but isn't a cop-out. So something like being shy, uh, not being good at public speaking, um, maybe getting too caught up in the details, not getting an idea of the big picture, um, that sort of thing. So just think about uh, you know, what might change in, in being a doctor, in you being a doctor. So uh, yeah, that, that's, that's one which is very tricky to answer on the spot. So have a good think about that beforehand. So now we move on to a discussion on qualities. These are the six qualities which they could realistically ask you about. Um, so for each of these, we'll go through and, and do a slide of questions for each one. And if you prepare your answers for those, you should be set. Let's begin with teamwork. Um, so as you look down the list of these questions, you may think to yourself that they, they seem pretty easy uh, and that you may not need to have too much preparation for this. Uh, and ordinarily, you might be right. But the, the pressure of the day itself, the interview day, is such that often your brain isn't quite working as efficiently or quickly as it normally would. So for each of these, I would recommend sort of coming up with a few different points for each. So maybe for the first two, you know, it'd be good to have eight or nine different points uh, for these two, um, the third and fourth point. Um, maybe have two examples for each. Again, for these two, maybe eight or nine, and then, you know, so on. So just have a few um, pre-prepared so that if on the day you can't think on your feet too quickly, then you'll have a few to fall back on. So with the first question there, um, just reading off the notes I had when I did the interview, I had things like um, members need to be reliable, uh, clear communication, uh, active listening, uh, what else? Everyone clear on their roles, uh, a unified and collaborative atmosphere, members drawing ideas from different sources to give greater variety in the outcome, um, a supportive atmosphere, those sorts of things. So you, know, you can have like eight or nine or even more different points like that and that'll set you up well. Same for the bad team qualities, which is the second point. Um, but try to think beyond just the opposite of the above, because they could ask you both, and if you're just sort of saying the opposite of above, then it's sort of a bit limited. So try and think of a few different ones. This is where having eight or nine different points sort of helps you out, because then you can sort of give a few for one question, and if they throw the opposite question, you can sort of draw on the others. So yeah, just have a, have a good depth of, of responses ready for that. As for the third and fourth point, um, that's sort of up to you and, and your life experiences. But try to think of one or two for each. And with a bad example, try to think if, if it was a resolved some way or if you helped out in some way to improve it, because they may ask you that as a sort of follow-up question. Uh, and as for these four, um, again, looking back at the notes I had, qualities of a good team member and then a bad team member. So, you know, things like has integrity and dignity, trusts others, inspires others to um, inspires others to action through their own actions, has a long-term vision and the ability to see how to get there through others, um, you know, those sort of things. Uh, so this one about whether you're a team member or a team leader, uh, I think you want to give the impression you can do both roles sort of equally, or you can at least do them effectively. So I think I said personally that it sort of depends on for one thing, the extent to which I understand the topic at hand and the goal and how to get there. Um, so if I understand it well, then I might be more inclined to become a team leader. Uh, and it also depends on how well I know the people I'm working with and what they're good at and how to, how to use them effectively. So yeah, get the impression you can do both pretty well, depending on the circumstances. Um, and same for the penultimate question there about whether you enjoy each one, sort of give different examples of when you prefer being a leader or a member. Uh, and as for the final one, that's another example of where if you weren't, if you weren't prepared, then you'd be pretty screwed, probably. Um, so I think I'd use something like biomedical advances, so things like pacemakers and bionic ears and stuff, um, which requires sort of doctors and biomedical engineers and electrical engineers and all these different fields working together and sort of, you know, bringing together their different expertise. So something like that would be good. Um, so on to conflict resolution, uh, and, and you'll see as we go through the six different qualities um, of which conflict resolution is the second, that 
a lot of the questions are very, very similar, and my advice for each of them is kind of the same about you know preparing a few different responses for each. So again, these two, the two top ones here about good and bad uh, strategies. Again, just have sort of eight or nine maybe, um, eight or nine different ideas for each. So things like you know being non-confrontational, uh, bringing or, or speaking to both parties initially in private, and then maybe bringing them together, see if they can work it out. Acting as a mediator, being empathetic towards all, you know those sort of things. Um, so the fourth one here about uh, what would you do if a team member wasn't pulling their weight? Again, that's sort of based off what I just said then about the different strategies. So have a think about that, and maybe have you know seven or eight different points about um, what you what you do and how you'd work through the problem. Uh, the fifth point there is quite a difficult and loaded question because you know you sort of it's a bit incriminating whatever you say. So, I mean, the, the trick here is not to sort of mention any particular group based on any social factors, but more sort of mention a, a type of person based on their personality. So I said that I found, uh, I found people who are unnecessarily angry, dismissive, non-responsive, or just appear to be not trying to help the common good and the common cause uh, difficult. That's what I found difficult. So something like that, something based off personality. And then how do you deal with them? Uh, it's very difficult, but sort of try and see if there's an underlying reason why they're like that. If there's a, you know, if they're stressed out, if they're not happy, if they're scared, um, and if not, then then see what could be helped in the situation. See what would help them act in a more constructive way, and just acknowledge that, you know, you may not be able to to help the situation ultimately. Um, as long as you don't say anything too incriminating, you should be fine with that. Uh, these two questions here down the bottom. Again, that's sort of based off your own personal life, so I can't say much about that. Um, but just have a think about that, because they're both quite difficult, I think. Um, to just think of one on the spot. So think about it in detail, and what it said about you, and what you did, that sort of thing. And again, this question, it's highly unlikely you'll get this one, because it's pretty tough. But maybe you could think of one example, and you, you should be fine for that. So for leadership, you'll see again that most of the questions are pretty much the same as before, just with leadership in, in the question. Um, so the same advice for all of these. For the top two, maybe eight or nine different points for those. And then for these two, maybe two examples for each. Uh, and then again, sort of um, a few examples for each of these. Just, you know, a good solid base. So for the top two, you know, just, just a, few good th a few things like um, leaders should be aware of their own limitations, um, but of confidence, they should be or respected but not feared, concerned and interested in those with whom they're working, um, willing to take risks, that sort of thing, uh, and then try to think of a few in addition to the, op the opposite of good qualities for the bad qualities of leadership. Um, maybe for these two, try and think of a few life experiences from school or sport, um, and just think through again, think in depth about what happened, what that meant to you, what you did about it, and why you felt that was good or poor. Uh, here, again, just sort of think about the different roles. You've probably got quite a few if you're um, if you're just finished school. Um, team member or team leader. We discussed this before about you know you should be able to kind of do both based on the nature of the situation and how well you know the subject matter and how well you know the, the team around you. Uh, and then again, just sort of a few stories from your own life down here. Good leader in medicine. I think I did Francis Collins, who's the um, sort of the leader in the, the Human Genome Project, that's quite a good example, um, but there's, there's quite a few. Uh, yeah, that, that's pretty much it. So same advice as before, just think of a few different examples for each. So now on to adversity and how to deal with adversity and criticism. So these questions are a little bit different from the ones before, um, but the same principles apply, so just have a few examples for each. Um, so the first, the first two are sort of, again, very personal and pretty similar to one another. So just think about maybe two or three different times in your life where you were quite, um, where you were faced with adversity. So it could be moving house, moving state, moving schools, uh, the death of a family member, or a pet. Um, it doesn't have to be huge, given that you're probably only quite young, um, and that you know you haven't had that much in the way of life experiences. Just think about, just think of a few examples and why that affected you, and how you worked through it. So for the criticism question. Um, the sort of points you might want to make include uh, working out if it's just a, a sort of a rude and mean criticism or if it's actually constructive 
Um, and if it is constructive, then, then approaching it with a positive attitude because it is ultimately a chance to improve um, a part of yourself. Uh, looking at it objectively and from the person's perspective, uh, being positive and smiling towards them to show that you, you appreciate the chance to improve um, and then and kind of work out some points or some steps to improve from there um, for future. Whereas this point here about uh, adversity, I think that's more about sort of putting everything in perspective and saying, even if a few things go wrong, we're still very lucky to be in this country and you know to have the opportunity to study medicine. Um, so you know, putting putting things in the big picture, um, keeping positive and not chasing those people around you away to you know so keep your support networks, um, and just sort of accept that what's happened in the past has happened and you can't change that, but then learn from that and make steps again towards a better future and to, to improve your future. So those are the things. Again, have maybe seven or eight different points for these two. Um, and for these two here, the second and third last points, uh, just think about a time in your life when you've helped others with adversity and what you did to do to help in that situation. So, I mean, techniques may include um, encouraging them to open up without pushing them, uh, letting them tell you what's troubling them in their own time, attempting to put yourself in their shoes, but appreciating that you may not be able to completely sympathise and understand, um, you know, offer, offer possible solutions or things that could improve the situation, um, give them new options and, and opportunities to, to go out and be constructive and busy, uh, maybe offer other stories of people who are in similar situations and manage to, to improve and, and find a happier place, those sort of things. Uh, and as for the last one, that, that should be pretty easy because and then, you know, you sort of get adversity in every step of the uh, medical pathway. So you know, even the process of getting into medicine, um, getting into a specialty, and then practicing medicine ultimately with um, you know, outcomes not always being as good as you'd like with patients, um, you know, developing a rapport with patients and then having them you know, die or experience suffering. Um, you know, it's fairly ubiquitous adversity in medicine. So just have a think about a few different examples. So decision making, and this should all be fairly self-explanatory based off the last four slides. Um, so my advice would be the same. Maybe have a few different points, maybe you know, seven or eight for these two questions at the top. And then just one example for each of these should be, should be sufficient. So for methods of coming to a decision, um, good methods I had include writing down the pros and cons of each option and then weighing them up, obviously. Um, taking as much time as you possibly can um, to, to make that decision. Trying to be in a, a positive but grounded mindset when you make the decision. Uh, trying to be objective. Um, try to get hold of those who've been in a, a similar position before and see what their advice is. Uh, and, and maybe even think of what the best possible outcome could be by taking one option. And what the worst is and then doing the same for the other. And what the most likely is too. Um, you know, some different techniques there. So just find a method that you think works for you and then stick to that. Uh, and then as for the examples, there's a few variations they could throw at you. One is uh, an important decision you've made in your life. One is a quick decision and one is one based off incomplete information. So have a different example for each of these if you can. Uh, and most importantly, work out or, or know how you came to that decision. So ideally you'll use the points you made in, in this question in those, you'll sort of apply them to your example. And the final one there, uh, that should be pretty easy because um, much like the slide before, uh, difficult decisions are also pretty, pretty common in medicine. So just think of maybe four or five different examples. And the final quality they might ask you about is your management of stress. So it's much the same as the previous slides, maybe eight or nine different uh, good and bad coping strategies. So, I mean, good things could be that, um, you know, good, good strategies to be that you might take time away from the source of the stress if it's feasible. You might have other activities which offset that stress, which help you release it. Uh, you may put things in the bigger picture again to kind of show that it's not ultimately that big a deal, um, those sort of things. As for the personal examples, maybe one or two examples for each of these and, and how you coped with it, which is the important kind of second part of the question. Um, so if you just finish school, that might be pretty easy for you. For the how can you tell when you're stressed question, um, yeah, I mean, you might just sort of think that you just know when you're stressed, which is probably true. I think it's good in this question to just draw on a few different factors. So draw on some physical factors like 
um, you know, a feeling of being tense, um, and then emotional and mental factors such as maybe um, like a not as much sense of humour as normal or uh, a disinterest in other people, uh, and maybe even sort of other cues around you. So maybe you know that because you've got a good support network and people kind of ask you if you're stressed. They say you appear stressed, that sort of thing. So I have a few different a few different methods by which you can tell that you're stressed. And then use the same things for um, other people and to, to kind of work out when they're stressed. Um, so, you know, things like if they appear easily aggravated or short of temper, um, or conversely, if they're a bit fat and tired, um, you know, that could also be a sign. Um, also sort of fidgety and nervous or having difficulty focusing. Um, and then sort of again, just to, to help them out, just show them the bigger picture, ask them what you can do to help. Um, just kind of sympathise with them if you can. Uh, just you know those sort of things. Um, yeah, and then that's sort of again pretty uh, pretty easy from there because again there's lots of stress involved in medicine. So just four or five different points again that would probably be fine for that. Uh, and you, you should be set for all the qualities. So it's a good idea too to have an idea of all the different issues that are currently facing medicine in your country. So here in Australia, these are the ones which really we should be, um, or you should be, having a look at prior to your interviews. Um, no, I won't go through all of them in detail because this video is long enough already. Um, but just in your own time, maybe put together a paragraph or two for each of these dot points, giving an overview of the, the nature of these problems at the moment. Um, so obviously rural health is problems with getting doctors into the, into the country, um, getting, you know, uh, medical schools out there, um, having resources uh, and, and keeping resources up to date, all those sort of problems, problems with funding and interest levels, um, interest is in human interest, not financial, so all those sort of problems. Uh, indigenous health is fairly closely tied to rural health too, obviously they've got lower life expectancies and a greater risk of many, many diseases, which is both sort of down to genetics and in the environment often, so have, have a good understanding of the nature of that. Um, third point, insurance. That's because society is becoming more litigious, which means that um, you know greater levels of being sued pushes the premiums up for insurance for doctors. So that's becoming, well, that, that's having a big factor or playing a big role in the um, the cost of working as a doctor. Uh, so waiting lists, they're they're probably pretty obvious for you guys. Um, that's just you know the waiting time people are. People are enduring at the moment for or before they get treatment or surgery, which is the result of uh, resources and doctors being stretched. The aging population is the fact that our population is getting older due to uh, a greater life expectancy, decreased fertility rates, and uh, immigration, uh, and that's going to obviously create a burden on the workforce in a few years' time. Uh, and the federal budget, obviously, pretty recent at the time of posting this video, um, and very controversial. So. Just look back to the most recent federal budget whenever you watch this video and work out the main uh, redistribution of money and resources, uh, any new initiatives. Uh, in the case of this budget, the co-payment scheme, just have an understanding of, of all the different uh, new initiatives and, and redistributions. And under that point there, so the first six you should just have a good general feel for those. And then from here down, abortion down. Um, these are all sort of moral dilemmas, much like what we did at the start of the video. So for each of these, it'd be good to have points both for and against both sides, uh, and then to have an opinion on that. So you make pro-abortion, anti-abortion, pro-euthanasia, anti-euthanasia, so on. Um, so just, you know, there's pretty pretty common arguments. Um, so you should be able to find quite a lot of points both for and against. Just make sure you've got them before the day. Uh, I won't go into it because it's all very personal and detailed, uh, and this video has been going for a long time, but just um, have a point for each of these, or have a few points, and you should be fine. So on to the simplification stations. Now these stations involve the interviewer giving you a sheet of paper uh, on which a medical concept is explained in quite some detail, uh, and from there your, your, your job is to read the information. Uh, absorb it and then relay it back to the interviewer in simplified language. Um, the idea of this station is that uh, as a doctor you'll have obviously a lot of uh, medical knowledge 
and technical information and jargon. Um, but when you're talking to patients, you have to put all this aside and explain quite difficult concepts to them in language they can understand. So in approaching these questions, uh, when you relay the information back to the interviewer, small mistakes don't really matter too much. Uh, ideally, you wouldn't have them, but if you, you know, but given it's such a large amount of information that you're absorbing in a few minutes, uh, it's fine to make a few mistakes. Just keep going, even if you think you've got a few things wrong, because that's not the main point of the, of the station. It's more about how you simplify things rather than getting every little bit right. So keep going. Um, in working out how much to simplify, your explanation, um, I would sort of aim at it like a 12 or 13 year old child. Um, and so really, I mean, any technical word, you should replace it with another word or another phrase. So use of analogies is also a good thing to have. Um, so in explaining a medical concept, if you can think of a, an analogy or a metaphor that um, most people would be able to understand, that's a great thing to throw in there. Even if you can't think of a perfect example, um, it'd, still be, it'd still be worth it um, to, to use it in your explanation, just to show that you know how to simplify things in, in theory, even if you know the execution isn't great. Um, just to show that you know how to use analogies to simplify things, that's great. So, so try and always use one of those. Um, continually ask if they're following your explanation is a good idea. So actually kind of stop at different points throughout your explanation and ask the interviewer, um, is everything I've said so far understandable or do you need any clarification? above what I've explained. Um, so do that you know, two or three times throughout your explanation to make sure that they're up to speed. Um, and to practice, you can just look at you know, like a, a textbook or even Wikipedia um, and just look up medical concepts uh, and phenomena and then practice simplifying them down. Uh, and you can also do that with words such as DNA, cells, nerves, you know, basic medical and, and biological terms. Um, but that's pretty much all you can do for these questions. So here's an example question for simplification. So this is what, well this is the sort of thing that the interviewer would give you on a piece of paper that you have to simplify um, in the space of a few minutes. So if you want to have a bit of practice then uh, pause the video now and give yourself maybe three or four minutes, uh, maybe even five given this is pretty long uh, just to get your head around it and then practice relaying it back in simplified terms and we'll We'll do a few points after that. Okay, so the first thing is that you want to eliminate any technical terms and jargon. So, um, obviously you keep the title of what you're talking about. You'd, you'd mention that term, which would be the autonomic nervous system in this case. But other technical terms like hypothalamus, pons and medulla, you probably want to kind of summarize that as um, sort of a control center at the base of your brain. That would be a good sort of simplified explanation of that. And again, you wouldn't use the word somatic nervous system. You just kind of explain to them that it's the nervous system that they're familiar with that results in, you know, sensations and movement. Um, you'd simplify these terms like respiration rate and perspiration. So, um, you know, rate of breathing and, and sweating. Just, you know, simple stuff like that. Um, using an analogy, something like a, a thermostat is the classic example for internal regulation in the body. Um, so maybe you could use that example or, or something which kind of has a feedback mechanism and is easy to un understand. Um, again, you'd, you'd ask them two or three times throughout this um, if they're following and uh, just sort of keep everything simple and condensed and aim it towards sort of a, a younger person. It's fairly simple from there, but this is the type of thing you might get, this sort of length and this sort of complexity. So just keep practicing that uh, method of simplification. Now onto role play. Um, and this can be amongst the most daunting, probably the most daunting station, because you've got, um, or the way it's set up is that you've got the interviewer, who you barely talk to, and then an actor, which is whom you, or is who you sort of talk to for the majority of the station. Um, and the idea usually is that you're playing the role of the doctor and the patient is, or the actor is playing the role of the patient. Um, and then there's some, and then you're given an instruction as to what the nature of the interaction is about. So usually it's either um, explaining to the actor, you know, or, or patient in this case, the nature of a new treatment plan, 
or something more difficult. So an example there is trying to dissuade them from um, you know, alcohol abuse or smoking or self-harm. So you'll be given this sort of outline of what you have to do. Um, and it, it'll tend to be slightly awkward or difficult, as you can imagine, given those examples. So just a few points about this. Obviously, you can't you know, recreate it here, but just a few points for the day. Um, the actors will be very professional and they're you know, very realistic. So, I mean, they may start crying or raise their voice or get angry at you. Um, that's all fine, obviously. It doesn't mean you've done anything wrong. It's just a realistic um, depiction of what might happen. Uh, in real life. So just keep in mind that it is all acting and it's all over pretty soon. So just keep it cool and hold your ground and uh, do your best. So to begin the session it's often good to just uh, use a few sentences like how have you been recently or how have you been since our last consultation or just you know what's been happening. Um, that's much better to start that way just to ease yourself into it to show that you're quite empathetic and so you don't just have to dive straight into the you know the problem at hand. So start with that sort of that sort of um, approach. When you get into the meat of the problem, um, you know the actor may start crying or being a bit upset. The important thing is that you, in the in that sort of moment you don't say things like, "I know how you feel," because you don't know how they feel at all, um, and it's a bit patronising. So a much better statement to make in that situation is, "I can only imagine what this must be like." or how difficult this must be. So, yeah, don't be patronising or dismissive. And also don't try to say that everything's fine. But don't try to sort of diminutize the problem, because it is probably a very real problem. Um, so you don't want to be seen as sort of um, dismissing it. Uh, so, also in, in dealing with this situation, it's good to be a figure of authority and control. So even though, again, they may be in not the best state, and maybe quite angry with you, you shouldn't be submissive. You should hold your ground and say, well, instead of saying, um, what do you want me to do about it? Give them options. So be the active one in the consultation and say, well, here are some options of how we can deal with this. Um, that doesn't mean that you don't listen to them at all. Obviously, it's very important to listen and to be empathetic and kind, but just be the one who takes the initiative. Um, so overall, just speak slowly, show empathy, Listen to them, keep your cool, hold your ground, and you should be fine. And the final station is just puzzles, which are fairly rare, but um, some unis use these in, in two or three of their stations, so I thought I'd put it in. So stations may be a physical puzzle, uh, by which I mean like a jigsaw puzzle, but often not to do with the picture, but rather, you know, uh, the different jigsaw pieces may have different numbers or, or colours on them. Uh, or it could be a theoretical puzzle, which tends to be like a UMAT section 1 question, uh, but much easier. So if you're given a physical puzzle, like a jigsaw puzzle, um, they'll probably make it very complicated, and you won't be able to solve it, or expect to solve it. Um, and your performance in that station isn't marked by how far you got with the puzzle. It's not about, you know, how much of it you got correct. It's about the processes involved in getting to that point. And so the way they evaluate those processes are by listening to your explanation as you're going through it. So the best method is just to talk out loud as you're doing it. Just give a sort of stream of consciousness commentary as you're working things out. It doesn't matter if you start off doing the wrong thing. Um, as long as you explain the logic behind what you're doing um, and keep your cool and laugh it off what, at the end when you, when you can't do it and show that you know, you've got a good, good sense of humour about it, that's all you can really do. So just keep talking, keep talking throughout, uh, laugh it off, and you should be fine. With the theoretical puzzles, um, it's often a concept like exchange rates or probability or other sort of basic maths. So you won't have to do sort of, you know, pure maths, but it's sort of a concept based off that often. And again, there's not much you can do about it. Just sort of take your time, think through it. Um, if you're at the interview stage, then you've probably done pretty well in, in section one of you, Matt, so just um, do your best with that. And that's all there really is to it. So again, if you need any notes, resources, tutoring, mock interviews, then get in touch. Otherwise, I wish you well.